America, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Great. Uh, all three board members are present. Um, do we have public comment? Yes. Gabby Swift. Carrie Swift, 25 Pocono Ridge Road. Um, I just came to speak about our issue with the uh, gas pipeline and compressor station. Um, my son has asthma. He was born with asthma, and as a child, if you've ever watched a child struggle to breathe, you never forget. And our, in our country, childhood asthma, uh, asthmatics are epidemic. We have an epidemic of childhood asthma in this country. They've realized the cause of childhood asthma is our particulate pollution. And who causes a lot of this particulate pollution? The oil and gas industry. Okay, so I was very disturbed to learn that Algonquin is trying to use town land to fix their 70 plus year old pipeline that runs through our town that we've been complaining about for years. Um, I understand they want to use town land, but we should not be helping these people. These are polluters. And I know all three of you, I know you're all very caring people. I know you really care about children. And I know you would never want to bring harm to children. But we should not be helping these industries. Um, Algonquin is really Enbridge. They use these native names as if they're nice, fluffy companies. The Enbridge is a huge international corporation. Uh, Iroquois is actually TC Energy Trans Canada. So these are huge international cor uh, corporations. They do not need our help. Any time that we give them something, they're transferring liability to our small town, and we should not be giving them anything. Um, they're trying to double the site, two more compressor stations up at Wiskineer, and in case you think that Algonquin Enbridge is not complicit in this, this is where their pipeline crosses over. Enbridge has four compressor stations in Brewster, right on the Danbury border. If you drive over the line into Brewster, uh, we went on a little field trip. You can't even see them. They're up on the hill in the woods right next to 84. They have four huge compressor stations. These compressor stations just billow pollution all day, you know, all day long. They're running gas turbine engines constantly, 24-7. If they really cared about us and our children, they would be running electric engines instead. They do not. They are refusing. And in fact, in this new uh, facility they want to put in up there, they are trying, they can't even meet the new methane regulation. So methane, as we know, is a huge cause of global warming. They cannot meet the new methane regulations. So are they putting in electric? No. They're trying to, you know, we'll make the stack a little bigger. Um, there's never been any ambient air testing up there. The only testing, we know the problems with Boeing. Everybody's read in the news about Boeing Airlines and how they regulate themselves and they do their own testing. Guess what other industry does that? the gas and oil industry. So those gas turbines up there are only ever tested by Iroquois' own consultants. All right, so I just, we should not be helping them. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Pam Krause. I think you have people here for the, I'm sorry? I think you have people here for the other meeting, V. Gray. Which other meeting? Oh. Can we just hold one second? Uh, is anybody here for the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting? No? Because that's being held next door in case we don't want to be at the wrong meeting. Okay. Thank you. Pam Krause, Tuco Road. Today is April Fool's, and I'm feeling kind of fooled. Over the last several months, a group of over 100 Brookfield residents have been actively following the deep air permit application of Iroquois gas proposal to place two more natural gas compressors behind Wiskineer Middle School. All of us know and understand that to oppose natural gas compressors is a heavy lift. Step one in objecting or demanding mitigation for such a facility is local government opposition. That's where feeling foolish comes in. It seems impossible, unbelievable, or even foolish to think that our local government is not using its resources opposing such a community travesty. Brookfield government is responsible for the residents' safety, including middle school children and proximate homeowners. Toxic air pollution and potential catastrophic risk are not rumors. Pollution 
or conspiracy or alternate facts. It is real. It is foolish to think this opposition truly exists among our leaders, even when informal discussions, verbal commitments <clears throat> of resources and press statements would have led one to believe that there would be active opposition. Is it also foolish to think that Brookfield opposes these compressors like other communities where such compressors are also being proposed and resource expended? If it is not foolish, then follow through. The status of the permit application is pending. There are alternatives such as electric driven compressor motors, which are best available technology and used elsewhere. It takes resources, time, and commitment and follow through for our local leadership to protect us and force a gas pipeline company to use clean equipment. Should deep notice and intent to issue, Brookfield residents are going to request a hearing and oppose the compressors and attempt to offer alternative technology and site mitigation. How about you? As a matter of fact, tonight we have draft letters prepared for you. The selectmen for the commissioners of, <coughs> for, <coughs> for the commissioners of Deep and Government Lamont, who must have an awareness of local government objection. By the way, if a permit is issued, we want your signatures to request a hearing. Or is that a foolish request? Would you all like these letters? Sure. We're all not in opposition. I mean, there's, Thank you. I'm, I'm in opposition. Just so you know. Good evening. My name is Eric Myers. I'm a resident at Two Cove Road in the Barkwood uh, Falls neighborhood. Although this is April Fool's Day, as noted by several earlier speakers, I'm uh, really serious, deadly serious with my comments tonight. I was unable to attend the March uh, Board of Selectmen um, meeting where a proposed cell tower to serve our neighborhood was discussed. The town's EMS providers clearly made the case for improved emergency uh, communications for this, uh, this community. And I personally have had three visits to the emergency room since uh, December. Fortunately, the cell phone worked in these circumstances, but its reliability is always poor. Clearly at the uh, March meeting, the uh, Hamlin Court residents were present and united in their opposition to any of the sites on town property across from the high school. None of this dimin diminishes the need for emergency communications in our neighborhood and the town must continue work with the uh, tower contractor to find a suitable spot on either public or private property. So uh, changing the uh, topic slightly. Also importantly, the town needs to show its opposition to a second set of natural gas fired compressors at the Iroquois gas pipeline and compressor station adjacent to West Kinnear Middle School. This project, which has been undergoing state air quality permitting review since 2022, proposes to increase the flow of natural gas to New York by adding two gas-fired turbine compressors, which will add exhaust gas products to the school and the surrounding neighborhood 24-7, if allowed to construct. In addition to the existing compressors and other routine natural gas methane discharges that are already at the site. The town should be protecting its residents from increasing pollution as well as more remote but catastrophic acute explosion or fire, which could endanger the school and the neighborhood as well. The town can actually benefit its residents by intervening in the permit process to ensure that this increase in pollution does not happen as well as mitigating acute catastrophic events which are magnified by the poor siting of this facility and the burdens and the burden to the town's emergency responders. In addition to intervening in this active air quality permit application, the town should revisit how much Iroquois Gas Pipeline LLC is actually paying in taxes. It seems to be much less than similar facilities in Connecticut as well as adjoining states. The second issue the town needs to address is the location of this facility 
with its proximity to the middle school and nearby residents. The town, or the school, and many of the adjacent residents existed when Iroquois put its original pipeline in in the 1990s. This represents a failure of the zoning process which should be revisited, perhaps with the, uh, the dispenser issue, so as long as you're talking zoning. So anyway, thanks for the opportunity to speak to the board. Thank you. Good evening, Austin Montero, 17 Dairy Farm Drive. Uh, so this is regarding the, the handling of the bomb hoax threats, threats and communication from the office of the first selectman. Uh, from the patch article this past weekend on Saturday, September 30th, the question at hand in, artic in the article was, what has prompted this activity? This activity being a hoax bomb threat, which is a federal offense, it's terrorism, and it carries a minimum of five years in federal prison. And obviously also a very dangerous situation. So anyone casting blame on someone should probably bring some receipts to the table because this is no light matter. Again, the question was what prompted this activity? And that was posed to our first selectman and this is Mr. Dunn's response. I think there is a national effort to ban books, commented Dunn in an interview with Patch.com. It has happened in Brookfield. The local rhetoric has been vociferous. It has generated some national attention. However, we will, are not going to let a few people with misguided intentions at best dictate how we are going to run our schools. So first off, um, that's just pure speculation, Steve, on your part, that has anything to do with anything. There's zero proof that a hearing on a book reconsideration has anything to do with a bomb threat, uh, terrorism, I mean, that carries five years in federal prison. That's a heavy statement to make. Um, I can see what's happening. I think a lot of people can see what's happening. This is an example of political provocation 101. Uh, it's a game we should not be playing here in Brookfield. It's a dangerous game. We are better than that. It's behavior that is very divisive in nature, and it's being done on purpose to cause reaction. And it's being used, unfortunately, for pol political purposes. Uh, it's a sad reality we're dealing with. The article continues, my, uh, my opinion is Brookfield is better than this. Um, we don't deserve those kinds of activities going on in our town, and I fully agree with that. Brookfield can be much better than this, but the only way we do that is with, with real leadership, not with what we have currently. You and Mr. Belden, you guys ran on civility, decency, and experience leadership. That was your campaign promise. This is yet again another breaking of that promise. Is, calling, is it civil to call out parents? Is it decent calling out parents saying that they are the reason for this threat with no evidence? Like that's five years in prison. You're saying these people are terrorists. That's crazy. Um, is this what experienced leadership looks like? Because if that's what it looks like, I don't want any part of that. I believe you owe the town of Brookfield an apology and a retraction on all of these statements that are still on the town website um, and in many other locations. Uh, blame and division that you have made within this town. That would be the decent and civil thing to do, and that is what an experienced leader would do. Thank you. Daniel Myers. <coughs> Daniel Myers, 16 Powderhorn Hill. Um, I'm here to talk about the pipeline as well. Uh, I have a few specific points. The uh, current town uh, draft budget has no legal resources committed to fighting this uh, project, particularly the expansion. Uh, we need a budget as a town to better understand our legal opportunities, intervention uh, strategies, et cetera. I'd, I'd urge you guys to consider an uh, amendment to the draft budget. The original construction of the compressor station raised concerns at the time from the state and others about the threat of kids being burned at Wiskineer Middle School. Uh, so the uh, Connecticut Siting Council found that, um, and FERC uh, documented that. Um, where is the concern for our kids when this project doubles the size of the facility? It seems missing. Uh, Republican and Democratic leaders in town uh, and state reps, uh, actually a state senator, um, and, and as well as uh, Mr. Steve Dunn, have publicly opposed the pipeline expansion, but committed no resources to fighting it. Brookfield is currently taxing the compressor station at $750,000 per year. The town with a modest legal research budget should be exploring ways to create a more deterrent tax code for any gas infrastructure, um, particularly infrastructure expansion in town, including the possibility of a different type of zone 
that would allow for a taxation rate that reflects the risks and costs of the community. The primary tax zone, uh, the taxation methodology for that station is personal property. It's a multi, this is a multinational corporation uh, whose personal property is being taxed. Iroquois has proposed uh, using combustion-driven turbines, uh, the emissions from which will directly flow to Whiskenier Middle School. The town should be demanding that they use electric-driven alternatives to limit pollution exposure to middle schoolers. When Weymouth, Massachusetts took a compressor station project to court, they got a settlement of $30 million. Where are our representatives ensuring it doesn't happen here, uh, or that we have the funds to mitigate it should it happen? The compressor station is undertaxed and has been undertaxed for over a decade due to a poor tax assessment that doesn't recognize the unique value of a compressor station located at the intersection of two major interstate pipelines. Undertaxing property opens the town up to potential litigation and liabilities from taxpayers and means that the taxpayers of Brookfield are subsidizing Iroquois. The town has every reason to reassess this facility to recognize its true fair market value. And I would add, it's not every reason to do it. It has a legal obligation to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Van Doozy, 198 Whiskinger Road. <clears throat> I'm here to talk about the pipeline, obviously. Okay. So April 2024 marks the one-year anniversary of Stop the Brookfield Compressor Station Expansion Group, of which I'm a part of, also known as 1900feet.org. I'm sure you've seen the signs. And hopefully you visit the site. <clears throat> the facility here in Brookfield uses high turbines to burn Canadian fracked natural gas in order to create pressure as it travels along the Iroquois interstate pipeline. Toxic emissions are generated in this process as debris from the traveling fossil fuel in the form of methane, benzene, benzene, etc., and all the other ugly names. Um, as it travels through New York State, Connecticut, right on its way to Long Island, no one from Canada to their benefits at all from this pipeline. <clears throat> they just suffer the effects. The mission of our nine-person community group and its hundreds of supporters is to halt the proposed expansion project that won't, as you heard, double the size of it and um, markedly increasing, increase the occurrence of planned and unplanned toxic emissions. Unplanned or emissions with no notice to the public. We've done our due diligence in examining the scope of dangerous community health risks associated with declining air quality from this emissions and the damaging and sometimes deadly effects of community pipeline explosions caused by aging sections of pipe. We're having a section removed this summer, as we know. So who's to say? We won't become instant victims, and I'm not kidding. The extreme heat de generated by certain explosions of, from these pipelines have been reported to reach four miles from the actual explosion site, by the way. People four miles away from the explosion, have they can't even touch their windows. It's serious. And what happens to people when they are exposed to that kind of heat? <clears throat> it poses serious uh, safety risk to those living within the expanded, they call it the potential <coughs> impact radius, which is the neighbors, um, if this is allowed to go forward. It now Currently, the radius of danger is just under a half a mile radius as the crow flies. But with this expansion, the radius circumference uh, expands to 1.5 miles as the crow flies. And it's going to increase the number of homes that will be directly, directly affected, not us that don't live there, by the compressor station compound from approximately 200 homes right now to 2,500 residences that will widen the southern Brookfield zone and spill into parts of Newtown and Bethel, which it doesn't do now. And we have produced a reference map, if you'd like to get it. So if I could just, I know it's important, my last thing, so if I could yield my, can I come back if, at the end of I'm anything? Sorry. Can I return no, tonight? Each person gets three minutes. Well, I'm going to do this to the letter to the editor then. So look for it, okay? Can, because this half 
Kathy, you, you need to speak to the board, not to. Thank you. You will. I hope so. Read my ask. I'm asking you to do something. So read it in the paper. Thank you. Who's next? Joanne Cassietta. I'm Joanna Cafiero, and I'm a, a more or less recent uh, Brookfield resident. I moved here when I was diagnosed with leukemia to be near my, my son. And I'm also going to discuss the compressor station. And uh, as a, a reference, I want to talk about a, a small community in Ohio, in Jefferson County, where the community made a partnership with three universities, Yale School of Public Health, uh, University of Cincinnati Medical School and a uh, University of Kentu uh, Kentucky Department of Epidemiology and they began they did a study because the residents <clears throat> in that part of Ohio were experiencing some <clears throat> immediate effects of their proximity to the compressor station the immediate effects were eye and nasal ir ir irritation nausea breathing issues fatigue severe headache uh, vertigo and unsettling odors. So the, these three university partnership people went in there and they used the EPA certified air monitoring equipment and they found alarming levels of volatile organic chemicals inside the homes. <clears throat> there were 25 VOCs, volatile uh, organic chemicals, 17 semi-volatile uh, organic chemicals, Benzene, 124 trimethyl benzene. I'm not going to read all these. It's a little bit of an alphabet soup. But all of them have already been detailed in peer reviewed journals to have very serious health effects. Chronic exposure to butadiene, cardiovascular effects, and leukemia. Naphthalene, cataracts, retinal damage, headache, gastrointestinal issues. Um, Long term exposure also. Benzene is an established uh, carcinogen, hematological malignancies, T cell lymphomas, follicular lymphomas, myelodysplastic syndromes, exposure to ambient levels of benzene, congenital disorders, fetal anomalies, spina bifida. Environmental justice is an important issue, and the EPA defines that as fair treatment, ensuring that no community bears a disproportional share of negative consequences from industrial, governmental, or commercial operations. We are entitled to meaningful opportunity to participate in decisions that impact our lives. Due to the rapid rise and a lack of transparency among the fossil fuel industry, we have to consider this a very serious public health situation. So thanks for giving me your time. Thank you. Jeffrey Schroeder, uh, 8 Meadowbrook Road. Um, I'm not as prepared as my neighbors, but uh, I, I would say without a doubt, um, I'm a little freaked out by everything I just heard today um, uh, regarding the pipeline, and that's why I, I'm here as well. Uh, <coughs> I have small children. I don't want them exposed to horrible gases. Um, I, I don't want them to you know, suffer from a massive explosion um, and burn to death. Uh, it, this should be the number one issue that, that, that our government should be pursuing. I, 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 I know it was mentioned maybe I could talk to FERC. I don't know anything. I'm, I'm just a tech by trade. You know, I know how to fix stuff. <laughs> um, I'm asking the town to step up. Please help protect my kids. I'm assuming you all have, I know, you all have children, some of you have grandchildren. Uh, please help protect mine, because this is pretty scary stuff. These, I don't think we, uh, I don't think we should be victims to corporate fat cats, frankly. <coughs> um, air coy, gas, they clearly don't care about us, they care about profits. Uh, I, I'm, again, I'm really disturbed by the stuff I heard, and um, please, please help protect our community and my kids. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen Gallo. <coughs> Hi, Ellen Gallo. 
behind Brookfield Meadows. Um, I'm going in a different route. I know that uh, the Board of Selectmen is aware that the town is faced with an important decision that has to be made regarding the sale of cannabis in our town. Um, since it's never been mentioned in any of these meetings, I think the town people want to know where the board stands in this decision. I'm not sure leaving it up to five people um, is the right thing for Brookfield, but evidently it's the way it has to be. Uh, we know where Tara stands, and she attended the zoning board meeting last week. And Bob, I know you said you were keeping an open mind about it, um, but we don't know where you stand, Steve. I mean, what about the transparency? Trans I can't say that word, trans you know what I mean, that you ran on. Um, I know some of you were at the meeting at the market last weekend, and uh, most we found out there that most of the surrounding towns have completely voted against it, and I learned that their decisions were made by the Board of Selectmen, and it never even got to the zoning boards. So Steve and Bob, we need to know where you guys stand on this, and it's an important matter, and will we ever know, really, where anybody stands on it? Also, there, Tara had made a suggestion that maybe the, um, the zoning board <laughs> The zoning board could come here and be put on the agenda and speak and tell everybody, tell you guys where they stand on it, how they feel about the whole thing. And obviously that's not happening. I don't know if it's going to happen at the next meeting or what, but I hope it's not too late by then because they know they have a moratorium on it and they have to know by a certain date what's going on. So whatever. I just hope that, that the right decision is made and that there's something that you guys can do to influence the zoning board, I don't know. But, I mean, if you were at that meeting, zoning board meeting, it was, I think there were three people for it, and many, many people that were outraged by it. One guy I thought was going to have a, a heart attack. He was so, so, I mean, it's, it's something that we really need to think of. I believe that medical marijuana is a good thing, but I also just found out that we have a place right down by Stu Leonard's, right there. So it's not... You know, and they want to put this right in Brookfield, they're awful close together. And if somebody really needs it me for medical reasons, they can go right there. It's not that far of a trip. It's, I thought the only place was way down on Mill Plain Road, and I felt bad for people who need it for medical reasons. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Frank Kwok. Frank Kwok, 40 Deer Run Road. On behalf of all tennis players, Board of Selectmen, I would like to thank you for approving and funding the resurfacing of the tennis courts at Brookfield High School. Long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, I support the regulations in front of the Zoning Commission. It was discussed last, as was just referenced, it was discussed the other, the other evening. The number of people in the room, though, represent a small sample of the population of this town. I would recommend that not only the Zoning Commission, but the Board of Selectmen canvass the wider population. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your public comment. Um, we're, uh, Julian, we're going to have a presentation on the town attorney. Um, as, as we have a policy in the town to go out to bid for any purchase over $20,000, we included the town attorney in that process, and Julian ran it for us. Go ahead, Julian. Thank you very much. Um, yes, good evening. I'm Julian Capitos, the purchasing manager here in the town hall. Um, and I'd firstly like to start by uh, thanking you for inviting me here to talk you through the process that we uh, followed and the due diligence to select a law firm uh, to recommend to the board uh, as town council. So those of you not familiar with RFPs, requests for proposal, uh, as Steve said, it's at the December board meeting, the board decided uh, to appoint Tom Beecher as town attorney uh, interim town attorney, uh, while we then go out to bid for legal services. Uh, the request for proposal defined all of the requirements for town council uh, and included the ex expectations of the uh, monthly retainer that we have. This was posted in January 
we gave bidders four weeks to re respond, and we had a good response. We had four firms submit bids, um, four excellent firms, actually. And the next step was then to review these bids uh, to decide on the successful bidder. This, so to this end, we made up a selection panel um, to fully evaluate the bids, make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. And this panel consisted of six department heads um, who most frequently use legal services. That was the Land Use Director, the Economic Development Director, the Director of Health, the Tax Collector, the Finance Director, and my good self, Purchasing Manager. So we each reviewed each bid individually uh, and then developed a bid tabulation setting out high-level snapshot of all of the firms, such things as number of attorneys, how long they've been established, uh, specialities, and, of course, the all-important price. The panel then met, and we agreed unanimously that two of the proposals didn't quite meet our requirements. So we um, eliminated those two, and the decision was taken to interview the remaining two firms, and they were Halloran Sage and Collins Hannibal. Uh, so in the interest of being fair, we developed questions, a list of questions that we would put to both firms. And uh, I should say at this point, the panel invited the first selectman to attend these inter interviews, but he recused himself as he didn't want to influence the panel due to his long-standing relationship with uh, Collins Hellenfin. Each interview lasted about an hour, after which the panel would share their observations and uh, views with each other. And by the, end, by the end of the interview stage, I can tell you, it was, uh, we were completely torn. Uh, both firms had given a very good um, account of themselves, and both had attributes that would be beneficial to the town. As part of the final evaluation, the, the panel contacted other municipalities where Halloran Sage is town council. Uh, all spoke very highly of the lead attorney and, uh, as, uh, and the firm as a whole. Uh, for the record, uh, it seemed superfluous to contact references for, Hallam, for um, Collins Hannafin, as we've all worked with Tom anyway. The, the panel also conducted very subjective and also objective um, analysis, comparing things like responsiveness, depth of bench, land use experience, uh, broader municipal experience, uh, experience within Brookfield, and again, cost. The upshot was there was no clear front runner. Collins Hannafin has served the town well for several years, 20, I believe, is it? Um, and everyone on the panel cited Tom Beach's responsiveness and uh, his experience in town. But it was also recognised that Halloran Sage has significant uh, expertise in land use uh, and has an impressive depth of bench. However, there was not sufficient compelling evidence to once again switch our legal services to another firm. Therefore, the panel has reached a consensus and has the following recommendation. It would be in the town's best interest to retain Collins Hannafin and Tom Beecher as the town attorney, who will continue to provide day-to-day -day legal services as town council under the monthly retainer agreement, and obviously picking up any ad hoc work arising from those cases. Halloran Sage has a unique experience with land use, and therefore the panel recommends them to handle any cases in land use that Tom is unable to take on. In addition, the land use has to publish their um, what was it called? plan of conservation and development uh, within the next 18 months. And uh, it is believed Helen Sage would really add value there. And then finally, the uh, emergency services study, which we did last year, uh, Hallow and Sage have actually done quite a lot of work in emergency services, so we'd recommend them for that as well. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions?
I don't. Bob? Any I questions? have several, yeah. Thanks, Jules. Nice You're to welcome. see you. Um, you just mentioned the other firm, Holler and Sage. Holler and Sage, yeah. So you're recommending that Collins Hannafin, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of that firm, Tom's firm. Tom's firm, yeah. Um, for a town attorney. But then this other firm is going to do what? Land, they, they, they're very good on land use, but also the emergency services study. Because uh, they'll be you know, like MOUs and things like that. We'll, we'll need their help. So for those items, we'll be going out to bid for those projects? Like for the plan of conservation and development, why? So yeah. we're hiring that firm, but we're going to be using this other firm on the side, and how is no, that? No, no, you're, you're maybe Julian wasn't clear. For issues where Tom's firm could not be the town attorney, conflicts. If he already represents somebody who has business with the town, we need to hire another attorney. Uh, after this search, I think the per the, the att attorneys we would go to first is. Uh, Haller and Sage. Mm -hmm. In addition, there are projects coming up that we might need to go to outside counsel, and Haller and Sage would be, based on the interviews that the uh, six managers had, would be our first choice. Obviously, if the bid was over $20,000, we would go out to bid, as we do with everything else. Okay, so just to get this straight. The retainer is at the same fee that we had it in in December, right? Yes. And moving forward, I don't recall off the top of my head what was budgeted in this upcoming budget, but is it the same amount, $60,000 thereabouts? Yes. yes, for the retainer. Okay. For the and then we'll be funding months. these other uh, law firms separately under which line item? Is it per project? Like when we need to pay for the, did we put that in the budget? The conservation, uh, plan of conservation? Development? Yes, it, we do have a, a budget for the plan of conservation and development and the planning and zoning merger and included in those budgets would be legal fees if we had any. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we don't know what they would be, but it seems to me to be pretty clear, especially with the plan of conservation and development, the state is putting additional requirements on towns for climate change and all sorts of things that we're probably going to need an attorney to uh, address those issues. Now, if Tom's firm can do it, then we might use Tom's firm. If Tom, we don't feel that Tom's firm is the right firm, we would choose another firm. Well, why wouldn't Tom's firm be the right firm if we're hiring him? Uh, it depends on the project. Yeah. So, for instance, the POCD would fall outside the regular retainer. Yeah, it would be. Okay. And again, the emergency, the, the, the emergency services thing would also yeah. fall outside. Just like tax cases before the Board of Assessment Appeals, those are handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, remember, the town attorney's retainer fee is for general advice over the course of the year to any department, any department manager, and uh, the firms that bid on this would give us advice. You call them up, say, is this possible? Can we do this? But if you get specific things like tax appeals before the Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, Tom's firm and every other firm would charge us separately for that. For to develop a plan of conservation and development, uh, that's an incredible amount of work. If we need to hire an attorney, that would be outside of the retainer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another concern that I have is that we're actually now conducting interviews and hiring firms without the oversight of an HR director and the first selectman. That's very concerning to me. <laughs> I'm like not you've sure got, I you've see. now got your employees doing the hiring actions for the town. No, they're not. This board is doing the hiring action. Yeah, they're making a recommendation based on their expertise. Uh, of these which people you had no part. Of which an HR director had no part. Uh, uh, this no. wouldn't be an HR yeah, but Tom, an HR decision anyhow. This is a this is a service contract. Tom, Tom's not an employee. Yeah. Tom is not an employee, so HR doesn't come into this. You just said that six department heads convened to interview these firms. Yeah. yeah. As a panel. Without an HR director but and without the first selectman. But these are what does an HR director have to do with looking at an RFP? I'm not, I'm confused. Well, most HR directors handle the hiring of employees. It's not an employee, but, though. Yeah. Or attorneys are, there, are not employees. Attorneys so your department heads are now conducting the interviews. Yeah, that's what because we're the, we're the users. They're the users. So they interview 
the firms. They made a decision to go and interview further. They're the two users. Firms. You've got residents as users, Steve. You just heard a million people say that we need legal help. In fact, you said in the newspaper the you were going to budget the to have legal help for the, the Algonquin pipeline. You're. Is Tom I don't know. Where you're going Algonquin pretty far pipeline? afield here. Is Tom residents work on do the not. Pipeline? Residents do not have access to the town attorney. If they want to sue the town or they want to have some action, they would hire their own attorney. I'm talking about working for the residents of the town, Steve. Yeah. So is Mr. Beecher currently working on the Algonquin pipeline issue? No. We don't have anyone working on that issue. That's a problem. And my final question is, Mr. Beecher, are you still representing the Candlewood Shores tax, tax district? I am. And that's not a conflict? Only if something specifically comes up. I mean, I'm not asking you. I'm asking the first selectman. Were you asking me? Well, no. I'm asking Tom. He's got his back turned to me. I, you're, you're talking to Tom. You're going to the attorney? I'm looking at him. He I asked you one question, and then I asked Your you a question. Your question went to the attorney. Yeah. He if just he was asked still Tom, for the I'm Cameron looking Shores to Tom to get district. his response. Tom, would you answer the question, please? If, if there was any direct conflict between something involving the Shores and something involving the town, then I'd bring it to both sides' attention. But most of the work I do for either doesn't involve the other. Well, I would check with someone who knows what they're talking about because it seems to me that there's a conflict of interest there when you read our code of ethics. If and when there is a conflict of interest, and this has happened before, where Tom's firm is representing someone who comes before the town, perhaps before zoning, on an issue, Tom says, guys, I have already, we're, my firm is already representing this client, I have to recuse myself. You've done that on a few occasions a in the past, yep. and uh, I wouldn't impugn Tom's credibility which is exactly or what veracity. Our, which is exactly what we sign up for as public officials, that if we, have a, if we have a conflict of interest, we would recuse ourselves. That's exactly what our code of ethics says. Right. Have you done that by serving on the, uh, with the registrar, Bob? That seems like a conflict to me. It's not a conflict no. at all. It's not a conflict at all. Both work for the town. I don't understand how that would be a conflict. But so, 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 so the guidance I've received on that, Tara, to be very clear, is yeah. I can help out with the registrars. I can be a moderator in the in the polling place as long as I am not on the uh, on the ballot. And they've been diligent about uh, about enforcing that. So. Are you working for the registrars as an independent? I'm as I a am, selectman. I'm actually I'm supporting that. I'm the contact point to the registrars as the, on our board of selectmen contact point. I am a red. I am a certified moderator in the polling places. And you get paid to do that. Yes. Okay. That was a little off. It's going a little topic, far what afield I'm here. Is but that I think we should be very careful because you've got over 1,500 residents living in homes, I should say, not residents, living in the Candlewood Shores Tax District. Um, impugning the integrity of our town attorney is not a place I would like to go, and I think that's what you're doing here. And Tom Beecher has always shown himself to be of the utmost in the ability to recognize if there's a conflict of interest, he would not, it, it, actually, we wouldn't have Tom as our attorney if we didn't think he was absolutely one of the best, most honest, upfront attorneys in the area. I'm sorry. And impugning his integrity and his ability. Not impugning his integrity, you just Steve. Did. I'm trying to be clear for the taxpayers who are did. paying the salary of the attorney right. to understand that he is also currently working for the Candlewood Shores Tax District. Correct. Was that brought up in the interview? I don't recall it coming up. Um, but we did talk about several places where there may be conflicts of interests. Yeah. Okay. So um, I would make a motion that the selectmen appoint Tom Beecher as a town attorney until February 2nd, 2026. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay. Uh, the motion passes to the one. Julian, thank you very much. Okay, now we move on to announcements. A coffee of the community will be held on Saturday, April 27th, 2024, from 9 to 10 at Angels Deli, located at 470 Federal Road. We encourage all residents to stop by 
with any questions or concerns. Again, you can sign up for a spotlight newsletter or Everbridge emergency notifications at brookfieldct.gov. Um, please also check the Town of Brookfield's uh, Emergency Management Facebook page. Uh, we do have vacancies on boards and commissions, Building Code of Appeals, Commission on Aging, Inland Wetlands, Municipal Building Committee, Commission, WPCA, Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Zoning Commission. There is also a significant amount of correspondence to the Board of Selectmen, and then we move on to the monthly financial report. Marsha? I do want to add that the Congressman Hayes is coming here tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we could. So, uh, Congressman, we, last week they asked us if Congressman Johanna Hayes can come tomorrow, I believe at 11, between 1045, 1030 and 1115, don't have the exact time. Uh, anybody wants to stop by and meet Johanna, you're welcome to come in. Why is she coming here? Uh, Johanna is coming to uh, meet our fire, police, and EMS because she has been arranged to uh, get a, a grant for the town of $965,000 to help pay for our emergency radio system. That was actually a grant under Senator Murphy, so. Um, that's why she's coming. What can I say? Oh. He wants to come. Okay. So, uh, back to monthly financial update. All right. You have the monthly financial reports, and I'll just go through one at a time. Uh, the first one is the expenditure report. It's got brown highlights at the top of the page. Um, we do transfers um, generally about once a quarter. Um, so, we do have transfers this month. We have um, intra-department transfers within the department of um, a total of 25,000 increases and 25,725.64 uh, uh, increases and decreases. Um, the biggest one is within the police department that they've got so many new people, they're working on training and that was 18,000 of that total. Um, there are also inter-department transfers on that same sheet that um, um, the Board of Assessment Appeals has concluded their business for the year, so we want to close those budgets out. Um, legal for tax litigation, uh, we want to increase. There's not new tax litigation. Uh, we just received a bill in January of 2024 uh, for services rendered back in September of 2023, and that's why the increase there. The um, uh, registrar of voters that um, um, we wanted to add security at their request, um, and that's 1,042.86. Um, the land use, the um, um, their sporadic wages, they're having more meetings because they've got uh, several new subcommittees, uh, plus they've started with the POCD um, meetings that all of which require the time of a clerk. Um, the building department, sporadic wages to try and uh, keep that going until June 30th. Economic development, the um, we generally assume, I think it's 33% of the economic development director's uh, wages will be covered by grants. Um, some grants are, um, allow that and some don't. Um, and so it changes year by year. And right now we've had less grants that allow those billings. Um, employee benefits, the health insurance, we've got additional monies there for um, employee turnover, leaves and vacancies. Highway, we've had a really warm winter that um, uh, we would like to take $90,000 out of sand and salt um, that we hadn't needed so far. Uh, the final billing, I think that left 30000 for the final billing. And the final billing came in today. It was only twenty-one thousand, so we may be able to take another eight or nine. Um, utilities, the electric. Uh, we did a lot of work during budget season with kilowatt hours, and and uh, projecting this all with kilowatt hours. Um, so we, it looks like we'll have some extra money there. Um, grounds overtime. We need more money in grounds overtime. That. Um, 
Uh, part of it is um, the elementary school and, and uh, keeping that and, and um, um, free from ice and, and um, uh, keeping up the grounds and there's multiple garbage cans and things like that have, that have been added. Um, part is for ice conditions. Um, evening events, that, um, they always have someone covering evening events and uh, prepping the fields. And there's been a, an extra amount of, of um, field changes which cause uh, someone from Parks and Rec um, to go out and prep the fields. Um, and then um, um, that frees up uh, um, between all those decreases are, are um, the net amount is 136,718. We want to move that into contingency for uh, potential future needs. Any questions on that? Uh, Bob, Pat, any questions? Okay, no questions. And I would make the motion to approve the interdepartment transfers through 322-24 as noted in the budget versus actual expenditure report and forward to the Board of <coughs> Finance for their review and possible acceptance and approval. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, second. Any further discussion? All um, those in actually, I do. That, this might not be the right time, but regarding the pickleball courts and paying for that, um, would that be something that this contingency would cover for... Where no. are we with those people? No, the pickleball court is completely funded already. Um, and it, the pickleball court is in the cash capital that right. um, we'll be getting to, I believe, next. Okay. So we wouldn't need to use contingency for it. In fact, right now, it looks like we'll be under budget on that. Uh, the town approved 100000 to go with the grant. Uh, I think the total was 586000 589. 589, off by 3000 Okay, off the top of my head. So that's completely paid for. So having said that, we have the motion. Uh, we have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. There you go. Okay. Marsha, continue, uh, please. Did you do inter and intra? Yeah. Yeah. Inter. Sorry, I'll amend that. Inter and intra. All right. Um, uh, capital non-recurring, that's cash capital that... Um, um, we meet with the departments every quarter and try and um, close out the projects that are done. So there's a number of these projects being closed out. Um, the, um, the beach, um, the auto gate, this um, uh, was put in the budget by the prior director and this is not enough money for that. And so the capital committee asked us to close that out and bring it back next year at the full amount of money. Um, and then the other one that's in the middle, that there's an addition of 53,000, and right underneath it, a decrease of 40,000. Uh, there was a police car that was um, in a crash. Um, and the net amount that we need, thank you, uh, the net amount that we need to cover that is 12,000. But the way we don't want to net the, the revenue with the expenses together. So we're asking for. 53,000, th that's the cost of the car has been totaled. That's the cost of the car, the cost of the upfitting, and $5,000 in case there's other things that they find. For example, they think the lights can be switched from the old car to the new car, but they might find that the lights don't work. Um, the, um, if we have to pay those extra things for th things that don't work, they will be paid by the insurance company. Um, so our amount is fixed at $12,000. I think it's $12,308. Um, um, and so we're trying, to, we're decreasing the budget by 97000 in total, increasing it by 53000 in total. Uh, the net amount is, um, would go drop down to um, surplus or fund balance, which is 44733 any questions on that? I don't have any. Bob, Tara, any no. questions? No questions. That's good. Okay. Uh, I would make a motion to, of, to approve the proposed transfers between projects in the capital non-recurring fund as shown on the attached uh, report through March 25th, 2024 and forward to the Board of Finance for their review and possible approval. Do Se I have a second? Second. 
Bob seconds. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Three zero. Oh. Uh, the next is in red, the ARPA funds. <laughs> that um, ARPA is um, expiring December 31st of 2024, and we have to spend all that money. One of the things that was in the original ARPA budget was the rooftop air handler, um, and then that needed to be reconfigured, and it needed more money. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is remove ARPA funding from that project. The concern is that it won't be done by uh, December 31st, and we don't want to lose that money. So we would fund that, and it's already in the proposed budget for 2025 with a different funding source. So we would reduce um, the funding there, and <coughs> we would increase the funding as what's called lost revenue, um, which can be used for anything. Um, uh, so that's taking 90000 out of one project and putting it into um, another. We do, this will go to a, um, through the budget process. It will go um, through all the necessary approvals um, to spend the 90000 as lost revenue. Okay. Uh, I would make an, a motion to approve the closing of the project for the DHS rooftop air handler. Uh, over the library for 90000 and transfer that fund to fund balance, those monies to fund balance under lost revenue. Uh, do I have a second? And for, I'm sorry, and forward it to the Board of Finance for their review and possible acceptance. Do I have a second on that? Second. Bob seconds. Any further discussion? So um, how will this be indicated in the budget process to the public as to what this money will be used for? Oh, it's going into fund balance, and then it can be used for whatever purposes that the town determines that we need money to be spent for. Mm -hmm. It's on the front of the budget sheet under fund balance, and it says ARPA lost revenue yeah. um, funding. So what are your ideas for that, Steve? We that, that's yet. the same thing that we've had for several years that we've planned uh, the budget, and in this current year's budget, we used 161000 of it, right. um, and then we would just use the balance of it in the 2025 budget. And, and um, so it doesn't get allocated out project by project, it just goes into revenue. So, Marcia, just to be clear, was this money that we're approving tonight part of the budget deliberations in terms of how they establish the budget, or is it new news yes. since then? Um, it was all part of the budget deliberations, and um, and it's been, this lost revenue has been part of the ARPA deliberations since we had uh, the ARPA committee um, right. several years, four years ago, I think. Um, we had at that point 1.9 million as lost revenue because there were rules back then on, on calculating lost revenue, and then they said, oh, yours are, your, uh, you're less than $10 million, you can consider it all lost revenue. Lost revenue just has more freedom of what you but can if my, it if my recollection is correct, that money went into the fund balance and then it was released, partially released or fully released in this budget because we used it to kind of trim off the, bu the, debt, the debt bubble, yep. right? That's exactly and that was a big piece of the budget discussion. And we went through that yep. that evening, so. So this 90 is going to defray taxes? Yeah, yes. basically okay. going to defer. So it's, it does, it's kind of, well, it's yeah. helping the That's public. the recommendation. It's, it, yeah, it's helping the public by lowering the taxes yeah. that we would have paid with the this uh, debt that's rolling in right. this year. So. And it prevents it, us from losing it. If we leave it under the current project and don't expend the money on the rooftop we'll project by yeah. December 30th, So this is a mechanical adjustment, but it was already anticipated in the budget process. So just adding more to it. This is moving the 90000 from that specific project to the general fund, and the suggestion is to use it under the lost revenue the taxes, right. for the debt bubble. Right. But we're not using it for, like, an ARPA-specific request, like no. some no. of the things we never got to, like a patio for the senior center or things like that. Not right now, right. no. Now, we can do that in the future, but right now we're just moving it and placing it under lost revenue so that we don't lose the $90,000. At this point, trying to tag it to anything particular 
right. it adds risk, I think, because uh, it's quite, you'd have to have that project finished. Yeah. But if we did want to associate it to one of those projects that were identified through the committee, yep. mm -hmm. we would have to take it back to a town yeah. meeting. Yes. It, it effectively becomes a regular capital project now. Yeah. Yes, and, and um, that was the prior town attorney had said that um, to add anything, otherwise it, it would have to go to a, a town meeting, and and we so can. So we would have to go to a town meeting, whether it was ARPA or otherwise. Yeah, that yeah. Um, um, if it was ARPA, he had he had, we only ruled on ARPA. I didn't. We didn't. But we're going to town meetings on yes. capital projects anyhow. We're doing yeah, that. Correct. On, we're and doing so that on Wednesday. For a certain amount. That's right. Yes. That's true. We're going to a town meeting either way. Yeah. Correct. This whole budget process and this part of it will also go to the regular budget town meeting. Okay, any further questions, concerns? Okay, uh, motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carries 3-0. Um, and the next one is the bonded capital projects that we're adding two items, uh, money to two items, and we've talked about these now for about four or five <sighs> months, and it's just been the mechanics of it that, um, um, on how it works, that, um, and it just got slowed down with our, our new, um, board of board of education that they needed more money for the control system and the roof um, um, top air conditioning um, the small amounts of money but we had to wait until it went to got approved by the facilities committee and then it got <coughs> approved by the board of education and now it is uh, finally coming to you okay any further questions, concerns? No. Those are small amounts. I, 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 I actually amounts. talked to them and they said these were literally just uh, bidding types of things that were small, so. Right. And the funding is already in those capital projects. We're just transferring it in those years. Yeah. 913 to 8,000. Okay, so did I make a motion? I don't think no, I did. I make a motion to approve the proposed transfers between projects in the bonded capital projects fund as shown on the attached report through March 25th, 2024 and forward to the Board of Finance for their review and possible approval. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Did you um, want to do it? Did Tara second? Well, you so Tara can second it. Bob okay. can have it. <laughs> um, any further discussion? All those no. in favor? Aye. 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 Carries 3-0. And then the final one is just a report. You have the revenue report um, through, um, I didn't write when it's through, but I think it was through last Wednesday. Um, and um, um, there's no surprises that um, we're doing well on the revenue uh, interest income because the rates are still at an increased level. And um, we still have bond money there because the, the school took an extra year. Um, uh, those are, that's one of our biggest um, uh, extra revenue um, items. Uh, taxes were doing well, projected to the end of the year to have collected more than the budget. Uh, that, that's good. Um, next year we're projecting a higher percent collection rate. Um, um, and um, yeah. I think that's. So this is all good information, all to the good. Yes. And, and possibly, um, a closing this week to get us another 150,000 of, of um, fees. Right, super, super. Okay, great. Uh, any further questions for Marsha? Is that um, grant for the radios considered revenue? Um, it wouldn't be considered revenue in the general fund. I do have some concerns before anyone gets too excited about it. I do have some concerns about it. It's federal money. A lot of time, f federal money um, can only be um, used for things that you haven't already budgeted or haven't already done a purchase order for. So um, I don't want everyone to get excited that we might get a grant and then find out that, um, oh, we are too late. Um, we don't qualify under their standards. We've had this discussion when it first was awarded to us. We might not get the grant depending on how the Fed interprets their own rules because we're right in the middle of the project now. Uh, one of the things that Johanna Hayes' office said to me, it will not pay for finished projects, completed projects. Our project is not completed. So we, they believe and we believe that we will get the funding, but there's always that small chance that we won't yep. depending on what the federal rules are. Yep, and if you were reading, um, 
I think it was last month, Sarah Palmer came in with her federal grant that, right. um, and it said you cannot um, order any items before the date of the grant. And um, um, small cities, for example, gives you a letter saying, ready, set, go. Um, so that's the concern with, with the federal monies. Um, um, so we just want to be op we want to be um, cautious ab about uh, what what timeline are we do you think we're on to really understand what we have or don't have um, hopefully we get more paperwork from her tomorrow um, and we can read it um, and uh, maybe we can't use it for the Motorola section but we could maybe use it for the towers and and that which we have not contracted for yet the um, um, so we will um, um, make sure that uh, um, uh, we look at it that way. Um, uh, this we, was a question on timeline. You think this is yeah. a month away before we know, or a couple months? Or? I, I would hope that the, we, we could read it pretty quickly, and so by next month, I uh, okay. hope so. Um, good. And we also have to look at the, um, the purchasing rules because the um, you Usually know, they come attached, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that, um, um, we didn't go out to bid. That um, um, that um, is that going to be acceptable or, or not to um, uh, for yeah. the grant? So, so maybe we get an update in next month's meeting. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Our hope is, you know, the project is not uh, scheduled to be completed before the fall, so there's still a lot of time here, and hopefully they'll be generous in allowing us to apply the grant. There is just that one caveat. Yeah. Okay. In Any a project like this, though, it seems that it would really never be complete because we were considering purchasing a uh, maintenance package because certain, I don't know enough about the widgets and technology to understand, but periodically and regularly these these items have to be updated or renewed. You mm -hmm. know, there's a whole, you know, that's why you buy a maintenance package, right? So it seems that... We should check and there see if a maintenance package would be eligible underneath. Yeah, it's up and running. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. We're going to do whatever we can to try to fit in. We get that grant that we right. just. I uh, would hate to have it announced that oh we're getting this great grant and then the next month say oops that right. um, um, because there was a town that that did happen to that they received the grant and then they um, couldn't use it for all these reasons. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, moving on, S item six, uh, fiscal year 2025 municipal grant program. This yearly program provides state matching funds for transportation to seniors and persons with disabilities based on the land area population of those over age 60. Uh, we do this grant every year. Uh, it goes to heart and they help us move seniors and people with disabilities. Um, I would make a motion that the selectmen approve the fiscal year 2025 municipal grant programs for elderly and demand response transportation and uh, the first selectman signature on the MGPO certificate. Do I have a second? Don't everybody you want to do it. I'll take it. I okay. second that. Okay. Tara seconds. Um, oh, sorry. Discussion? I have a question. You said heart, but I don't see that indicated on here. Yeah, because our, our agreement is with the state. So this grant assignment, you can see it says grant assignment at the top. Uh, it will be to heart. Okay. Right, we will coordinate and assign it to heart. Any further questions? Do we review hearts? Um, service levels regularly oh absolutely we have a um, person who sits on the heart board Maureen Farrell I used to sit on that board I think did you sit on it also no but heart would come yeah heart comes in and later. makes a presentation to us uh, they they are pretty responsive uh, if we say well we need some more help like many years ago we got them to make a loop through town hall okay right they're pretty responsive their main work is up and down Federal Road but they do also work and go pick up seniors and disabled, take them to doctor's appointments, things like that. I, I just, I, I heard from one resident who's, who when I was knocking on doors this summer, saying sometimes it's hard to get them. It's on it that, probably on that, is. It was a disabled situation. Yeah. So. yeah, I think it's gonna be interesting to hear how things are going for them since the road configuration, I think a lot more people might be using the bus. Yeah, that's what, uh, so what the amount of buildings going in. Yeah. 
Should, well, we, should we schedule them for a visit to give us an update? Sure, we can do that. I'll do that. Let me write that down. Okay. I mean, they provide one heck of a service. Right? They do. So for the, especially for the cost that we pay. So yeah. I, uh, it's, I'll invite Rick to come, to, you know, the executive director, yeah. to come and, and give us a presentation. So we have a motion. We have a second. All those in any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries 3-0. The next is our master municipal agreement with Connecticut DOT. Uh, every 10 years we have to do this revised 10-year master municipal agreement with uh, the Connecticut Department of Transportation covers both municipally advertised construction projects as well as projects advertised <coughs> by the seat by Connecticut DOT on behalf of those municipalities. Since the original uh, agreement was consummated 10 years ago, the CTDOT's business practice have evolved to include many grant type construction projects. The revised agreement contains a new Article 4 specifically tailored to administration of these more streamlined, typical, typically state funded grant type construction projects. The existing agreement is set to expire on April 28th, 2024. I would make the motion that the selectmen approve the new master municipal agreement for construction projects. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, for discussion purposes, the town attorney has reviewed this agreement. Which is I don't know a lot of pages. 200 pages, and uh, as approved, uh, the board of selectmen uh, signing it. It's just so we have that back up because it's a lot of information. Uh, so we got a motion. Do I have a second? I second. Oh, sorry, you second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries three zero. Um, Region 5 Homeland Security Grant Program Memorandum of Agreement. The Memorandum of Agreement between the State of Connecticut Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection slash Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security and the Town of Brookville regarding the use of federal fiscal year 2023 State Homeland Security Grant funding. The motion is that the selectmen approve the Memorandum of Understanding concern regarding the use of federal homeland security grant funds. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion or questions? So what exactly this 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 grant, what do we use it for? Uh, this specifically? is specifically. Uh, this is for things like um, purchasing equipment, cots, demos, region five, emergency supplies. It's, it's supply, so it's things that, that, that storage that's up in the, yeah. uh, the the ambulance barn right, filled with right, them. Right, okay. right, right. Is this the grant it. that um, is based off of population? There's a calculation. It's like eight thousand dollars. Yes. Or something. Yes. It's not a huge grant. It's not a huge grant. And then we have to have a match. Uh, I don't think we do have to have a match. Um, it can be an in-kind match, I believe. I'm sorry. I believe this is the one that can have an in-kind match and not necessarily a dollar match. Okay. Is this an annual grant or I don't remember this one. Yeah, I think it is an annual yeah, grant. Um, you remember now that we have a, a full uh, actual uh, paid emergency management director, we're eligible for some grants that we weren't eligible for before. Mm -hmm. uh, remember last month's meeting, we got the approval. Yeah. And this is similar to that. This is a win for the town. Um, I don't know if we've had this one before. Okay. HS, H, what's it called? HSGP. Yeah. And this is just approving our memorandum of understanding, meaning we will follow the federal guidelines. I looked, at it, I looked guidelines. at it. It didn't look like a, 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 it's pretty boilerplate stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's not onerous. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries 3-0. Okay. Uh, in the call, of the, this is regarding the town and school budget. In the call of the annual town meeting scheduled on Tuesday, May 7, 2024, at 7 p.m. at the Brookville High School Auditorium, the Board of Selectmen shall recommend a date for referendum consistent with C8-3 of the town charter. Um, the motion is that the selectmen approve to recommend in the call of the annual town meeting the date of Tuesday, May 21st, 2024, for the fiscal year 2024-25 operating budget referendum. Do I have a second? 
Second. Okay, Tanner seconds. Is there any discussion on that? Could you just refresh my memory? Did we already approve the town meeting on May 7th? Uh, the town meeting doesn't need that. This is to set the voting date. The right? town meeting's uh, dictated by charter. Yeah. See, and, uh, okay. the town meeting is set by charter. So if we set May 21st, town yeah, meeting's you know, two meeting weeks before. Um, so we have a motion. I'm sorry, did you Tara, set? Tara seconded. Tara seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Right. Aye. Aye. Carries 3 0. Oh. Second, a motion is that the selectmen make a motion to approve the mailing of a postcard reminding residents to vote at the budget referendum on Tuesday, May 21st, 2024. Do I have a second? Second. Bob seconds. Any discussion? How All much those is in favor? I'm sorry. How much, what's the cost? How much is it? Uh, it costs about $3,500, I think. We do this every year. It is in the budget. We have 7,500 houses, 50 cents a peach, 37.50. Um, so about 3,700. Um, I think it's also important to just remind people. Okay, so we have a motion. We have I a went, second. I went, I went to send that. Oh, I sent okay. it out like five times because people forget that that but that referendum all the time. Yes, that's true. So. We only get about 40 percent of people out voting. Okay, on updates. Uh, no, the ten. Vote on that. Oh, I'm no, sorry. No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. You were an aye? I was an aye. Okay. Okay, uh, just f updates. The town of Brookville was awarded $4,000 from the Emergency Management Performance Grant. That's the one that Sarah applied for last month. Um, capital Projects, special town meeting. Uh, the, uh, the motion is that the selectmen approve and recommend approval of the capital projects resolution scheduled for the special town meeting on April 3rd, 2024, and recommend a referendum date of May 21st, 2024. Do I have a second? A second. Bob seconds. Any discussion on that? Just a comment. That, that's, that, that lines up the referendum for capital on the same day as the, the referendum operator. on the budget. And that's right. the hardest juggling act we have on scheduling with these town meetings and referendums. Yeah. And so we've got to go approve this so that we don't have multiple referendums. Right. Has uh, the special town meeting already been noticed? Uh, yeah, it's already been noticed last, uh, 10 days before, yeah, uh, the week before last. And we approve that? We approve that. Yeah, okay. we approve That's that. Yeah, that was approved. It's just that there was never actually an approval of the resolution itself. Right. And recommended it to the town meeting to, rec to approve it. So okay. we'll charter, we just need to clean that up today. Okay. So, having discussed it, any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries through. Oh. Before we move out of updates, can I make a motion to add a couple of other items for discussion that you can make a motion? Sure. I, I move that we add the cell phone tower issue with Homeland Towers. Is that the name of that company? Mm -hmm. um, the bomb threat issue, the marijuana sales process and the pipeline based off of what we heard tonight, since we're all sitting here and we have Mr. Beecher and these are things that we should address as a board. Uh, so you're making a motion for to add three things. I think four. Yeah, the cell phone tower issue, where we are with that, I'd like an update. The bomb threats, has the FBI investigated? Is anybody going to be held accountable? Is Are they going to see justice? The marijuana sales process I'd like to discuss with you so we understand what's going on here. Um, and the pipeline. Okay, you made a motion. To I'll second that. that. You'll second that motion? Okay, so we can discuss all of those things. Um, the first issue, Let's Homeland Tower. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. All the motion is just to add the, those four items to the agenda. That's all that's on the table yeah. right now. Right. Okay. So the motion is to add all four things to the agenda. And to have a discussion so we can... Well, then we would have a discussion. Yeah, that, that, that would have it open the discussion. And we had a second yeah. to yeah. do that. All those in favor of doing that, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. So on the Homeland Towers, uh, 
Homeland Towers came to me last week and said that they did not want to present this week but would like to come in May okay. to our May meeting. That's the update on that. On the bomb threat, I did issue in spotlight today an update for the town on where we are. Obviously, the police are continuing an investigation here, and when they first started their investigation, there is limited information they are willing to give out, which is the responsible thing to do. Uh, what I can tell you right now is that both the state police and the federal authorities believe that this threat was not credible. And by not credible, they mean they did not think that it was a real threat. Uh, the state, when this initially occurred, declined to send their bomb sniffing dogs and their uh, emergency management people because it was not credible. The feds obviously did uh, just also told us through the police department it was not credible. The police department is continuing to investigate this. We did have bomb sniffing dogs though. We yeah, we did. We were that. able to get another authority to have dogs come in and go through the schools. Um, we checked all of the town buildings and the schools, went through all the video of all the buildings that we have. Uh, all the buildings were checked by staff and the police. Uh, we went through the whole thing on that Friday. After that, we did receive additional threats, and some of them are copycat threats, meaning in at least one case, it was just sending the previous threat again to us. Uh, most of these, I, I believe every single one of these, came through dark web uh, websites, anonymous websites based in Russia, where you can go onto that website, you can create an account, you can send an email, and that site immediately eliminates any information they have on you. So it's very, very difficult to trace those people. Uh, I won't discuss where the police are on this. Uh, I think we'd let them move forward. Uh, these threats came through Russian dark websites. Um, they don't believe that they're credible. I agree with them. But in an abundance of caution, we closed both town hall and the schools the first day. We cannot shut down all of our buildings every time we get a threat. Um, that's what these people want. These people are terrorists. They want to shut down our town. They want to terrorize our residents. They want to make everyone feel unsafe. And I'm sorry, Brookfield's not going to put up with that. We will always put our residents' safety and our children's safety first, always. If a threat comes to us that the police or federal authorities or state authorities say is credible, we will address it immediately, just as we did this one. And, but to overreact is also giving them what they want. These people want to see their email quoted on the nightly news. But they want to terrorize people. So, you're, so again, these people, you're, you had said that it was because of the parents who don't want the porn in the school. I did not say that. I did not say that. In each one of the letters you signed in conjunction with the superintendent and the chief, chief of police with your name on it as well, Yes. you're putting blame on the parents who spoke out uh, against we, I'm sorry. Parents. No, we did not. Read the letter. We did I've not read it blame the parents. Times, there are we did not threats. blame the parents. I'm sorry. Never mentioned parents at all in that. Well, the parents are the ones who are right. in opposition to the pornography in the schools for minor children. Yeah. And that I'm was sorry. finger we, pointing. A resident tonight we asked. For did not policy. mention the parents at all. You may believe it was our, uh, directed at the parents, but it wasn't. Um, so you're um, not going to apologize on the cannabis issue. Uh, so you're not going to apologize. Apologize for, for what? saying that people who didn't for don't want the porn truth? in the schools <laughs> provided to minor children no, are no. responsible for these bomb threats. No, because I did not say indicated. that, Tara. It indicated. I it did was not very say clear. that. I did not say that, and I wouldn't say that. So, you're so not let's move apologize. on. Let's move on. Okay. I think we're finished with that subject. Got it. On a cannabis project. Um, my feeling is is that we have a zoning commission for a reason, and their job is to go through this process. They're having up to three hearings on the uh, application of whether or not the town of Brookfield should allow the manufacture or sale of cannabis projects in town. Uh, they had a hearing last Thursday. They're having another one on April 14th, I believe, mm -hmm. and then possibly a third one at the end of the month. Is that correct? I'm pretty sure. So does month. the charter call for that? Why is it in the hands of the Zoning Commission? It's a zoning okay. issue. Are we going to allow this or not? Yeah. Tom, go ahead. Do you want me to weigh in? Sure. Because they can treat it as a zoning regulation, whether to allow it or not, or to continue with a moratorium, which they have the option of, of doing as well. But those are zoning regulations, and so the Zoning Commission is charged with either initiating regulations or reviewing zoning regulations. 
In Danbury, for instance, the zoning commission adopted a regulation that permitted up to three different types of, of uh, cannabis retail establishments, either a mixed hybrid and medical, purely retail, or purely medical. Uh, all those licenses have been approved in Danbury. The one on Federal Road is just purely retail over, mm -hmm. over across from Pepe's Pizza. The one that has medical marijuana is over on Mill Plain uh, Road. <coughs> Ridgefield, on the other hand, their zoning commission was taking it up, but the Board of Selectmen decided to go on a parallel track and decided to pass a town ordinance that prohibited all those establishments. Can we do that here? You can. Yes, we yeah, could. So why aren't we? Why, why, why is, why are we just saying, okay, you zoning commissioners, go ahead and do this? Because the zoning commission can react much more quickly. How right? hard is it to write an ordinance? It, I did several it, during my two-year term. Yeah, it takes time. In you have to post it. You time. have to have town meetings. You have to vote. You have to have people come in. You have to have registrars. Um, the zoning commission can do exactly the same thing using zoning laws at a much lower expense and much more quickly than we can. Um, an ordinance right now seems to me to be uh, too much. I think we should allow the Zoning Commission to go through their process, understand what they're doing. Uh, I, I think, Bob, I don't know well, how you so feel look, about Well, so look, I went and spent a lot of time reading about that this yeah. summer, and I, I, this summer, this weekend, and I, uh, and I, uh, I read a lot about the Ridgefield thing. The Ridgefield Board of Selectmen didn't start down the process of an ordinance until it was clear that their zoning commission was going to uh, actually support such oh. installations in their town. It was in reaction to what was happening in okay. zoning. And so uh, there were some news, news articles that says because, because zoning has made you know, uh, indications that they were going to allow them, that they started the process with the Board of Selectmen. So, they even they let the zoning go down the path a little bit before they uh, they jumped in as a um, as a board of selectmen and New Milford did the same by the way. They just revisited it in February. Their, their town council set another moratorium. They don't have an ordinance against it yet. Rich, New right. Milford. New Milford does have an ordinance. No. I have actually read it on their the website newspaper. last night. Yeah, I think they have an ordinance. I'm yeah, I, I, I bet town council passed an ordinance, and they uh, and it was, it was on their website. To continue the moratorium. No, it was no. actually. Oh. Yeah, it's actually a. So yeah, it's actually a. Uh, it's a ban. Okay. So uh, so they uh, so it's it's so if I kind of go through the things, New Fairfield and us are in the same position. Right. Both of uh, both of us have a two year have had a two year moratorium, mm -hmm. and they're both up for uh, making a decision in May June type of time frame. Danbury we know is allowing under certain conditions already. Newtown and Bethel have bans. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, Bethel has a ban, but there's a grandfathered uh, uh, establishment on Stone on Stony Hill right next to the first diner to have one. Yeah, they, that's been there for you know ten years now, I think. Um, and interestingly, in Newtown, New the, the selectmen said, why don't we put a one or two year ban to just kind of get so we can get used to it. And the zoning actually went more aggressively and said, we're going to put a full ban in. So, I asked so that zoning question, was more if we at the zoning commission meeting last week, I asked if we somehow were to get to a ban, whether it be <coughs> the board of selectmen, the town voting, or the zoning commission not adopting the regs, because they said that that would be a essentially a ban without the regulation. No, so I don't know, uh, no, no. I wouldn't what advise they, that. Mr. Timmerman no. said that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't advise that. If they're going to ban it, they should put it in prohibited uses section. Right. Okay. Because that's how Bethel Nonetheless, got Nonetheless, if we got Bethel to a ban, yeah, that's how that one uses. because there was no regulation at all. And so the applicant came in and said, we're applying like we're a pharmacy. Right. And the town planner said, "Yeah, we've got to let them. We've got to treat them like a retail use in the particular zone that allows retail use," and they got approved. My yeah. question to them was, and this is what I'm trying to explain right now: if we hypothetically banned it, that ban can be reversed at any time, right? It could. The zoning so board, so if they either way, it's, 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 either way, if, if, if it's a town ordinance, you can obviously also repeal a town yeah. ordinance. If it's a zoning regulation, that can be amended or repealed and changed. 
So either way, it's that, that's, that would be the same. So you, earlier you mentioned it's, it's faster for the Zoning Commission to go through this, but they're not done with their public hearing yet. They're going to evaluate, I guess, all the letters they're receiving. There was some kind of survey that went out. There were people who came for public comment. I'm sure there will be more. You know, that all takes time. So, But our process, would, if we do it from here, it will take more time. Yeah. To draft an ordinance? Yeah, that's yeah. what a town meeting. We have to draft the ordinance. We have to have a town meeting. We have to notice a town meeting. We have to have a public hearing. We then have to have a vote. Our process is longer. Just well, they, they, by they, the they, they said they're, they're intending to have their process finished, finished by, by the, the time the, the middle of May Middle comes. of May is when the moratorium Because that's when the moratorium ends. Agree. And I talked to Kurt. He says he's working really hard to get it done. Yeah. Uh, but before that moratorium lifts, and I think I just go with the noticing of town meetings <coughs> and drafting and, and our, our meetings, it would take longer. It would, ours would take longer. But they also have the option of just extending the moratorium. Yeah. If they wanted to take more time. Sure you know, with the process itself. One thing I wanted, I don't know who mentioned it, but the Board of Selectmen can't call the Zoning Commission before it to have a joint meeting to find out what's on their mind. When a Zoning Commission acts, they have a specific statutory duty and they have to do that in the confines of their own meetings. Now, if any Board of Selectmen or any other citizen wants to go to their hearings and talk, as you did, there, that's fine. But so how does the Board of Ed come to our meetings to provide updates? Well, it's a joint, jointly called meeting, usually. It's yeah. a joint no, the, the I, I, usually, I would come give an update periodic, yeah. an informational but update. So if they came and talked well, about their schedule. Bringing in the whole zoning commission. No, no just no, no, the no. commissioner to say, right. hey, this is where we are in the process. Right. This is what's happening. These are the amount of letters we had in opposition, which they didn't say that they weren't forthcoming with that the other night. I had to ask. Probably. There were like that's information that's available from the office. But the zoning commissioners aren't supposed to speak publicly okay, the on how they feel Laura, about an issue ran. because then they're forming an opinion before the matter has been decided outside of the confines of just deliberating with their own fellow but commissioners. But if we if we ask them for an update on their schedule and what information that they, what input they were yeah, getting, the office can provide that. I think yeah. it would. I think it, it came up because it, people are confused about what the process is yeah. because oh, right, all right, these right. towns are going about it very differently. Yeah, that's, and that's if we had the opportunity as a board of selectmen to just say no right here and right now, that's a big time um, saver. <laughs> we, we can't do that. Um, well, why not? We'd have to create an ordinance, and creating an ordinance has to be written, then it has to be approved, it has to go we to a vote. We can use four other towns as a sample. It's already in draft. You still have to go to town meeting. You still you have to, to notice the town meeting. You have to have a public hearing. You have to have a public hearing before you go to the town it's meeting. It's not in the too it's hard to do a, category. It's a long process. So um, <coughs> that's where the the, the uh, zoning okay. board is right now. I can well, send out. Where are you gentlemen on it? Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I see. I was in a meeting last week with our fire, EMS, police, our health department, uh, Brookfield Cares, discussing the national opioid settlement and what that funding. What should we spend that funding on? And they're coming up with ideas on what, you know, whether it's uh, Narcan sets or whatever it is, they're coming up with suggestions to use that money. It must be used for either education, prevention, et cetera, et cetera. There are specific rules as to what you can do. And um, one of the fire EMS guys said, you know, the advantage of having dispensaries is that you know what you're getting. If our kids are buying a pot in the high school, there is a fair chance it will be laced with fentanyl. There is a chance when you're buying it off the street. So if you want to keep people safe, you would, and I thought this was kind of the opposite of what I thought he would say. He said, you should regulate it and allow it because it's safer. In theory, but then you have the illicit drug dealers who come in to undercut the more expensive that's sure. so Sure. It's it's we're chasing our tails. It shouldn't be here at all. Period. <laughs> well, if you don't have it here at all, to his point, people are going to go to illicit dealers, and God forbid one of our children gets some of that pot, and God forbid it is laced with fentanyl, that could kill the child or kill the resident. So his point was: Is it better 
to have the dispensary where people can get it legally and safely, right? That's a reasonable you argument. You have to be I of age to go there. You have to be 21. Yeah, so. no, and no, nobody under 21 ever has a uh, beer. Uh, people under 21 have access to drugs. I'm sorry, they do. I wish it wasn't well, why true, would we provide but it is more true. Access? Uh, this is. I'm just making a point of what this well, person I'm said. I'm trying to understand your rationale because um, it's sounding to me like you're a proponent of it. I'm not a proponent of it. I'm, I want to wait and see what the zoning board does. The zoning the main board point could vote here, yes, and then all of a sudden we're going to have it in our backyard. Well, we'd have to look at it. Uh, there, are, but what I'm saying is there are good reasons to approve it. What are they? I just told you. I'm not going to go through it again because it stops people from getting fentanyl-laced marijuana if they're buying it at a dispensary, it right? it costs more illicit use. Sure it dealers. costs more because it's pure and it's guaranteed to be safe. If you're buying it off the street and it's on the street corner, you're going to get what you get, right? And we, we, we also need to remember that it is legal in Connecticut now. And it you can legal. go to butter. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And they deliver do, it to your door, which do was also we brought need up the other night. A, another dispensary in Brookfield when there is no. literally one mm -hmm. 500 yards from our border. No, we do not. For any resident who wants to go there. You know, it's, and I think we should allow the zoning board, they're taking a lot of input from a lot of residents, and see what they come up with. I don't think we, at this point in time, that I would agree to have the Board of Selectmen take this up as an ordinance. I'm just suggesting, Steve, that yeah. we could have 10,000 no's. We don't want it here, right? But the five zoning commissioners could still vote yes. That's true. They could. So, they could. So you want three people to override five people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what you're saying. That's okay. leadership. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if it's, if it's necessary, we'll have to have that discussion. We'll look at it. I think that's right. I, I think, think we should take it to town vote. Let the people decide. Um, can, 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 can the zoning matter be taken to town vote? No. 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 We would have to take, create an ordinance and then go through our process. Okay. What so about you, Bob? I, I know at the coffee you said you were still considering. I'm listening. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you, Tara, the, the, I know too many people on the medical marijuana side that if that, that are on chemotherapy or in severe pain have found it to be a, 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 a boom, right? And uh, so I've been a fan over a while, uh, quite a while of medical marijuana and its positive benefits and, and, uh, and how that is. I see no need to have a recreational marijuana facility given one's right where it is. Right. I mean, it's, we've got, Danbury's allowing it. They've got one right on our border. I grew up in a town where the biggest, there was a dry town in Connecticut. It was one of the last dry towns in Connecticut. And the biggest liquor store was just across the border, and the town was proud that they were a dry town. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing. It doesn't change anything about what our residents will do or not do because it's right there. Um, but I see no need for recreational marijuana in Brookfield. And, uh, and I, I but I, but I would want, I'm listening carefully to the medical use side. Um, because they, that's a long way to go to Mill Plain for someone who's in pain. That's a fair, that's so fair I think, So I'm listening, if, yep. I could, if I could net that out. Okay. Okay, so we had that discussion. Um, pipeline. What do you want to do with the pipeline? Yeah, so going back to the I think you were quoted in the newspaper as having said you were going to hire a lawyer or something to consider hiring an attorney. Um, the overall process here is it's managed by FERC, uh, federal government agency. Um, they work with the state, and I don't, can't remember the EC. I can't remember which department in the state they work with to um, regulate and approve these types of things. The overall regulatory authority is very clear, like the cell towers, lies with them and with the state. The town has no legal standing to stop this. Now the town can make its opinions known, 
the town can say we don't want this in our town. You know, we could hire an attorney and take the Iroquois company to court. Um, we probably could prove standing. I'm not sure, right? That we have, we would have standing. vested, right? We have, we have standing, standing, right? Um, the question is, we could spend a lot of money pursuing this in legal fees. Are we going to be able to change the outcome? Spending that money. Isn't it our duty to try? Our duty is to do what's best for Brookfield. And spending $300,000 on a law case that you don't believe you're going to win is probably not doing well, if it the best for Brookfield. that we potentially could help the community, the children in the school so close by. I mean, we have all these worries about how dangerous it is. Uh, but yeah, we're not going to do anything? I'm, I'm not arguing about any of that. I'm not we're, arguing either. I'm trying to understand what it is you plan to do vis-a-vis this, this. I think quadrupling we need to discuss it further. The uh, we can add this to our Board of Selectmen meeting, have a further discussion at our next meeting. My point here is we have an op obligation and, and a responsibility. A duty. Yeah. To do what's best and right for Brookfield. Uh, and I, I think we all agree to, to that. The question becomes, is hiring a lawyer and fighting Iroquois doing the best thing for the town? So, so to, right? me, to me, you got to take it a step at a time, right? Mm -hmm. so first step isn't going all the way to hiring a lawyer and having yeah. a lawsuit. The first step is advocating. Right, and we ought to, be, I, I, to, to, to my way of thinking, I think all three of us have said at one point or another <coughs> that we're very concerned about this topic. So how do we uh, bottle that into a deliverable that has some power, right? Um, short of lawsuit, right? Um, because I don't think, you know, I, you know we, I, we ought to be strongly urging whatever agencies are actually have this on their docket, right, on how we would like them to think. Right, for example, and I don't know, Tara, while you were in office, whether you actually went on, on any any formal sort of town letter head to any of the agencies or not. But if we haven't done that, we should. And if we I have agree. done it, we ought to double down on it. Right? I, I mean, so I, I, to me, this is about us making our voice heard and representing our, our constituents. So. I don't think I took it that far because I had just toured the facility yeah. and then they came back and said, well, this is where we are in the application process, which had been delayed <coughs> because of COVID. And so right, they right. were waiting on some environmental so it just wasn't the right timing for it yet. permits from New York. So <coughs> or something. I don't, to I me, to me, to me the, the single most important thing that I've been hearing is that uh, this is a, about air quality in our community and danger, uh, you know, the, there's the catastrophic risk and I've actually met, no, but I've met with the, the engineers on that project. Yeah, they're gonna tell you no, Bob. And I understand, and, and everybody who I say that to dismisses them. They were very credible. So, but the air quality, we heard that from every single speaker here tonight, and that's the topic that's in on the docket for the state of Connecticut is the air quality. And to my understanding, there has only been modeled air quality studies, not real air quality studies, where they actually go, you know, measure particulates and things like that. Maybe the answer is we need to demand that a third party, you know, air quality review be done, not some engineer coming in and saying, oh, our model says it's going to look like this this far away from our facility. Yeah. And, uh, but there's a lot of things we could go do that would be give some strength to the concerns that we're hearing, um, including telling people and uh, you know speaking truth to power, right? On what our what our residents are feeling. Yeah. So well, I uh, think it's prudent to do that. I, I think the air quality is one approach. But well, that's what's on the docket. That's why I jumped it. on that. And right. right, we had that lady from the state who monitored the air at the new school project. She <laughs> put her back to work. She did a good job. She did a really she, good she job. She did a really good job. And, she was uh, on it. 
Um, and, but that was an asbestos measuring thing, and I think it's a different, a different set of tooling and whatnot. Mm -hmm. At one point they talked about there's a truck that the state has that they can come park in different areas and measure the yeah. air quality. Maybe we ought to dem be demanding that that come here for a month or two and give us some real reports. Um, because if it's not if it's not a problem, we would like to know that. And if it is a problem, we would like to know that too, right? And uh, yeah. that would then give us enough to decide what our next step would be. They've come before the board before to give an update on where they are in their process. That might be a good first step, so we better sure. understand the timeline. I mean, what? Are I can't. Yeah, we can all invite. All of a sudden, one day, start their project, and we're going to be like, oh, yeah. it's here now. Yeah. We can invite Iroquois, and I'm sure they'd be willing to come before the board. I can invite them Unless to my board. You know who I'd like to hear from? just go straight to a letter. You know who I'd like to hear from is the state agency that's going through the air quality and what, what their timeline looks like. You know, what, where, where do they think they are in their process? Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't delay. I think they're pretty far along and close to okay. either. Have already obtained the, the engineers, when I or? spoke to them, said they expected it 24 or 25 was what mm -hmm. they said. They said, and probably more likely 2025 uh, before they get the state uh, to really engage. Yeah, because when they started this project, it was probably five years ago, and they told Ten me at the ago. time they would be finished with it when did in November of 2024. FERC approved it in 2012. Yeah, I it's think. Been if I remember that date. Yeah, right, that's so. right. I think that's right, um, 2012. And so it's past FERC, right? It's uh, it's not on FERC's agenda. It's on uh, it's way past FERC. It's, it's on it's on the state air quality board's agenda, and that's where the leverage is. And that's the long pole in the tent. So like the train's left the station, and we the train's idling in the station is what's happening right now. The train is ready to go. It's idling in the station, waiting for the state approval. Yeah. So. I think that's a good idea. We can inquire, and I'm willing to do that. To the I'd actually make it where demand. They I wouldn't make it inquire. Yeah. Right. So should we proceed with a letter in opposition from the three of us as uh, a starting point? Or? I'm not sure it's opposition. I think what we need to do is, one, to your suggestion, invite Iroquois to come make a presentation to the Board of Selectmen. I think that's reasonable. I think they would do that. And second, uh, we need to go to the State Air Quality Board and say, hey, to Bob's point, we have seen modeling of the air quality based on this equipment and whatever it is. We'd like to see actual air quality testing. In fact, that's what we want, and we think you should provide that before making and, any And decision. I'd like to hear their opinion of what doubling the capacity with gas turbines would be, mm -hmm. not and, and, and whether they could insist on the electric turbines, which we heard about a number of times here tonight. So yeah, there's a lot of discussions we could have with them. In fact, I'm th I'm flashing on you know Greg Dembowski's really good at navigating the, the state agencies. Maybe we could sick him on uh, and figuring out the right people to talk to. Yeah, and have well, we know some of them, but we yeah. We need to also do our homework and figure out how other places that might not be in Connecticut, but how they've been successful in stopping this. Certainly, I think somebody alluded to that tonight where. They, yeah, I, they weren't able to expand their mm -hmm. operations, which yeah. is what I actually we spoke to the doing. supervisor, which is I guess the equivalent of mayor in Dover. Okay, his wife's a tax collector. He let me know. Oh, okay. Kind of so about four thousand people, and they and have they have a, a they have a compressor station, station there. Um, interestingly, though, they get there is an agreement between Iroquois and the county for the compressor station. And that the county gets 75% of the funds, schools get 10%, and they get 10%. They well, they end up with about 10% of the total revenue that Iroquois pays. I'm going to say in lieu of taxes, because they don't actually tax the facility. And he said we get about 200,000. Did, did you discuss with them how did you how do you get that revenue? Because we're, we're not are we getting revenue from them? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, the you said they're getting, they, yeah. they, they have enough revenue, they're the, divvying it up amongst the all county, these agencies. I heard $750,000 yeah, tonight. The county over there gives them the revenue, and yeah. there was some master agreement with Iroquois. Well, there's no county here. So there's no that, county so here. So we should be getting 100% of what it was. I'm just we kind do. of curious what that magnitude of what they're getting yeah, is. Yeah, I think tonight Dan was here. 
Um, we have two types of profit taxes we get, obviously real estate and personal property. Iroquois is the number two taxpayer in Brookfield. And they pay us about $1.8 million a year. Okay. And that is, the numbers people have are not correct. And I can get you the exact numbers, but I've looked at it. There's real estate and personal property. Um, I've talked to our tax assessor. The depreciation schedule that Iroquois uses for their personal property, you know, it starts at 60 million. Are they using double declining, straight line? The depreciation schedule they're using is more favorable to the town than the one we would use, is what Tammy Fisk told us. Then why does Dan say we're not collecting appropriately on it? I don't think he's looking at both real estate and personal property, because they are the number two taxpayer in, in Brookfield. So they are, I think it's about 1.8 million. Um, I think he didn't include the personal property taxes. Now the equipment that was put in, the they said taxes. originally was about 50 million, 20 years ago is when it went in about. Yeah. And so they've depreciated it over time and they give us the value. So with uh, addition? The would addition would be about $100 million in assets. That's what you're And saying. we would get taxes on that? We would get taxes on that and that would be about 1.8 to $2 million a year in taxes on that additional personal property equipment, right? Now they told me 90 to 100 million four years ago. I've got to believe the cost has gone up since then. So maybe it's 100 to 110, I don't know. Um, but to, in the end, in the end, the, to, the taxes are important because there are a lot of money we're talking about here, yeah. but that's the safety and the air quality, right? Is what we got we got to stay focused on that. And I think if we start inviting too many agencies of the state, we're not we're going we're not gonna have a or it will be more of a biased approach. It'll to be dilute. It would be diluting the argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with Bob that uh, we should go after air quality and um, start there, right? I'd just like to know what their schedule looks like. Yeah, to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, so we'll put together a letter and send it to them. Um, I'll have Greg do, he's really good at digging out who to talk to. Well, I'll tell you what, this is one to me that would be, uh, if we could figure out the right letter to write, we've got a draft here tonight, right, mm -hmm. of a letter they recommended to us, mm -hmm. that would be a good start. Um, it would be. And, uh, but I think that would be a good reason for us to, there's very few reasons we ought to have a special meeting, this would be one of them. Mm -hmm. in my mind. I agree. Right, so we could, we could agree on a letter. Yep. How strongly we want to yeah. Say. So why don't I put that together, and then if we have, to, I'll send it to you both, and then we can have a special board of selectmen meeting. And, and just hash through whether hash it's, through you know, it quickly and strengthen it or you know, right, 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 exactly, right. Okay. All right. Well, so I you. think that's all for those I subjects. I think with the good news is we're all in 100 percent agreement on this. So yeah. uh, that's a question of how quickly can we act and how strong can we act. So, yeah. and eventually it might turn into uh, legal action, but I wouldn't it leap might. to the yeah, hiring hiring a lawyer until we're sure we need one, right? Because I, I agree with you. You don't go sp throw money out of you know past you know until you know you've got a good chance of winning. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent. Okay. All right, so let's, can we move on? Well, thank you for adding that. Not a problem. Consent agenda, uh, we have the selectmen approval for routine matters, board of selectmen meeting minutes, um, driveway bond release, excavation, bonds, employee changes. I will state those, Trevor Scott was rehired as a seasonal PNR grounds maintainer. Kevin Stiles was a new hire as a full-time dispatcher in the police department. Alfonso DeMassi was rehired as a temp mail courier in resignations. Alexandra Rose as the temp mail courier and Dorm, Dawn Marcut, uh, assistant assessor, resigned. Hmm. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve items A to E on this consent agenda that I just discussed. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? No. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye, three O's, great. Um, additional, so now we get to the fun stuff. Appointments, I would make a motion that the selectmen appoint Tom Keller, uh, Republican, as a member of the Inland Wetlands Commission with a term of 4-1-24 to 2-2-26. 
Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? I am very happy that Tom would be interested in this. We always struggle getting people on Inland Wetlands, so this is great. Yeah, it's going to be great. Nice one. Um, I make a motion that the selectmen so of all in favor. Oh, I'm sorry, all in favor. I thought we did. Aye. Sorry. I that carries three. Oh, I make a motion that the selectmen appoint Bradley Cook as an alternative member, alternate member of the Parks and Rec Commission, with the term of four one twenty four to two seven twenty eight. Do I have a second? Seconded for discussion. Okay. What's the discussion? Um, so this was an item that we. Um, we tabled last month, mm -hmm. um, if you recall, because we had two very equal candidates um, come forward um, for one slot. Um, and uh, we have three alternates on the, uh, on the Parks and Rec Commission, and the, uh, we had filled one in our January meeting, if mm -hmm. you recall. We put uh, Brian Zimmerman, I, I yep. think, on that. Um, and, uh, and we had um, uh, Holly, Carl, and, um, and Bradley right. Co Cook come forward uh, through the various channels. Um, at the time, we had gotten a special request from the uh, chair, the co-chairs, they call themselves, but one's a chair, one's a right. vice chair of the of the uh, um, Parks and Rec. of the Parks and Rec Commission to, ha to be able to give us their input. They acknowledged in their letter to us that it's our decision, right, to decide who we are appointing to boards. Um, but they did write us, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, "Good morning. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to meet with the two candidates that apply for our open alternate position, Ed, Laura, and I. Laura, I'm presuming, is our Parks and Rec." Nice. Director, yeah. Um, yeah, met with Holly and Bradley separately on Monday afternoon. We were equally impressed with both candidates' backgrounds and thank them both for sharing their experience and desire to join our commission. After some discussion, we all collectively feel that Holly would be the best fit. She comes with a very diverse background, including a rich history of volunteering uh, for the town in multiple capacities. Holly impressively continues to want to give back to our community, presenting herself with infectious passion and wholesome intention for serving. We hope that the Board of Selectmen agrees with our recommendation and appoints Holly Carl to the commission at your next regularly scheduled meeting. As always, we enjoy, we welcome your feedback and appreciate your support. And the signed by Jimmy <coughs> Santiago and Ed Butt, right. that were the two officers. Um, to me, when I, 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 we very seldom go out and ask the commissions to do these interviews, but these two candidates were both really good and they were really even, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, Mrs. Carr at our last meeting said we probably ought to be thinking about having um, uh, uh, more uh, female pre representation on this board, and I agree with that. Um, so considering that uh, A, they went through the process of interviewing and they, they actually thought about it for what works best for the commission and it would be more, it would add a, to a gender balance on a commission that demands that because we have women's and uh, boys and girls sports, women's and men's sports um, uh, in our parks and recreation programs. I think I would be more supportive of Holly Carl in this position than I would in Bradley Cook. And as much as I love Bradley Cook, by the way, right? He's a great guy. Right? Yeah. But I just think it's the, and this is an alternate position, and it would be, to me, appropriate to, uh, to appoint Holly in this case. Yeah, I think we would disagree on that. Um, the person leading that position is a Democrat, uh, a female, Kylie, and we thank her for her service. Um, we have always, as a town and as a board, uh, replaced people based on, if we have to, an R with an R and a D with a D. If, thi if this was the case and those were reversed and Holly was a D and Bradley was an R, because they're both qualified, I would be supporting Holly. But she's an R, she's a D. I think there is much to be gained by keeping positions where they were, uh, that if we have a Democrat on a board, to replace them with a Democrat on a board. I know we're not 
required to do that in this case, but given that they're the two people who interviewed them, remember it's not the entire Parks and Rec board, just two people on that board, um, made a recommendation. That's fine. Uh, it's the first time that I know of that we've ever done that. Um, I would still support Bradley. I understand you support Bradley, and I've written you and told you I disagree yeah. with the logic on the R for R and yeah. D for D for a couple it, of reasons. You have your reasons, I have my reasons. I think we've discussed it in caucus. I don't think we're going to change each other's minds. I don't think so either. Okay. And which way do you feel? I want to go with the recommendation. I think, I don't, I was just thinking, I don't know what the split is of the mix of R's to D's on that commission. It's relatively even, and it's mostly a lot of unaffiliated. They're alternate on that positions. Quite yes. a few, yeah. It's a lot yeah, of them. I mean, this would make the alternates, which you got to think about separately, two R's and a D. Okay. And the All rest right. of the commission's kind of a mix. True. The chair, the chair, Mr. Budd, is an unaffiliated. The vice chair is a Republican. There's some Democrats on there. So. So I've made a motion. We had a second for discussion. I would uh, finish the motion. All those in favor? Aye. All those against? Aye. No. So that motion fails. Does anybody wish to make another motion? I move that we, the Board of Selectmen, appoint Holly Carl, a Republican, as the alternate member to the Parks and Rec Commission with the term of 4124 to 2728. Do I have a second? Um, yes, but I'd like to offer an amendment. Okay. Um, so, yes, I second. Uh, but I'd like to offer an amendment. I actually reviewed the terms on this mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, yeah, commission. Um, right now, you're supposed to have the commissioner, the alternates, two of them have to be a two-year terms, and the third one has to be an alternating with that. The, the other two member alternates have ter terms that go 24 to 28. Okay. We need to do this one as 24 to 26. Yeah. Right. So that we can get back on the, uh, the right you schedule. Know, they, they don't all they don't all finish at the same time. So I would like to offer an amendment to change the date to two two twenty six. Right. I'll second your amendment. Okay. <laughs> so any further discussion? I think you have to pick a, you have to vote on the amendment. And then oh. Vote on the all those vote. in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. That's three zero on the amendment. Um, any further discussion on this? All those in favor of appointing Holly, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. That's me. So it's approved to O. Oh. Okay. Um, I would make a motion that the selectman appoint Richard Martino, Democrat, as an alternate member of the Police Commission, as recommended by the DTC, with the term of 4124 to 2728. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Is he replacing a D? Um, no, I think there's an open position. I'm pretty that sure there's an open. by who? I, there's an open position on the on the board as an alternate. That was vacated that's the, by an R? <laughs> I mean, this is the thing, right? Yeah, like, I know. No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's been open for quite a while. Richard. Richard Keith. I'm sorry? What was the affiliation? Okay. Uh, I've met Richard directly. Smart, smart guy. I think he'd make a great addition to the police commission. I think, Bob, you've met him too. You oh, know I him. served with Rick on the Board of Finance back in the early 2000s. Oh, okay. He's a fabulous commission member. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I actually think they're I think adding uh, you know, having the right number of D's there that's a very that's a, that's very a commission R that's board. very R R heavy yeah so it is. Uh, is it yeah, yeah. yeah. Like four yeah. four like to four one, to four, one. Four, four four Republicans to one Dem and I don't know what the alter alternate side yeah. shares a D <clears throat> okay so we have a motion we have a second is his bio in here I'm sorry I didn't have yeah it is should be okay. Um, any further discussion? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Carries 3-0. Oh. Okay. Having no further business, I adjourn this meeting. Yay. Go Yukon. <laughs>